So let me record. Oh. All right. So let me go ahead here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about thermochemistry. which is chapter five, okay? Now, thermochemistry is a pretty broad subject and it is also talked about in the next course, Chemistry 1200, where we talk about topics such as entropy and free energy. For this course in chapter five, we're just gonna talk about energy and enthalpy really and internal energy and enthalpy, and then we'll leave entropy and free energy for the next course, okay? Um, so let's talk about thermochemistry. Um, essentially, the idea is that there is this, there's something that exists in nature, which we call energy. Okay. And energy is kind of difficult to define from a principle perspective. So what we do is we use a practical definition, which is energy is the capacity to do what we call work. Okay, so work, the symbol for work is a W and we're gonna use the symbol for energy is gonna be an E, capital E, all right? so. Energy and work. So then we ask, well, what is work, right? So the issue of work is related to the concept of a force and the concept of a distance. So, so let's talk a little bit about this. We all recognize that if you have an object on a desk, for example, and that object has mass, and we know that we have friction, right? that we can apply a force to that mass and we can accelerate the mass. We can get the mass starting stationary and actually cause it to move, which means that it undergoes an acceleration, right? And if that mass moves some distance, which we'll call X, I'll call it X, okay? So that's the distance that it moves, then we can define the work as the force that we're using to push that mass times the distance that the mass is traveling. And so I'll write it as F, um, Fx, right? And so work we'll define as the force applied to move it through some distance, okay? And so anything that has the capacity to do that, to move a mass against a force or to apply a force and cause the mass to move, then we would call that energy. And so if you have a bicycle and that bicycle is, you see here's a rudimentary bicycle, that bicycle is, you know, at the top of a hill and it's not moving, we would still claim, even if it's not moving, that it has some amount of energy. And the reason for that is that it does have the capacity to move you, right? So if you're sitting on that bicycle and you roll down the hill, there's a potential at least for you to start accelerating. And so, you know, we call that potential energy, right? So that leads us into the idea of potential energy. Now there's different symbols used for potential energy. Sometimes it's a U, sometimes it's a V. I guess what I'll do is I'll just write E sub P for potential. And potential energy is the energy associated with position, where something is. So in chemistry, that's important because if we have a nucleus, which is positively charged, and an electron, which is negatively charged, 
the position of the electron relative to the nucleus affects how much energy it has. So this particular arrangement where the electron is pretty close to the nucleus would have a different amount of potential energy than if the electron was further away, right? So the position of the electron is determining how much energy it has. And since the position is determining that, we call it the potential energy. So, you know, think about like if you have a building, if you're up at the top of the building, you have more potential energy there than you would if you were on a terrace that's only on, say, the second floor, right? So here you would have less potential energy down here. Up here, you would have more potential energy. In general, we're not concerned with potential energy of, this would be gravitational. You know, the reason you have more potential energy up here is because of gravity. We're not concerned with that so much in chemistry. We're more interested in the potential energy that's related to charges. So when electrical charges are separated by some distance, they have potential energy. And we'll talk about that later in other, in other um, chapters. But the point that I just wanna make is that potential energy is the capacity to do work, right? A chemical battery is a good example of potential energy. You have positive charges in one part of the battery, negative charges in another part of the battery. They're separated by some distance. There's potential energy in there. There's the potential to be able to do electrical work, to run a circuit and to produce light or to run a cell phone or a laptop or what have you. That's potential energy, okay? The other type of energy is called kinetic energy. So we have potential energy, which is based on position. And then we have kinetic energy. So E, P, E, potential energy. is position, it depends on the position. The second one is kinetic. So I'll write it as E sub K. This is kinetic energy. Again, different, different symbols are used. Sometimes people will just put KE for kinetic energy and PE for potential energy. Sometimes they'll just put a K for potential energy and a V for potential energy. This is based on motion. Okay, so potential energy is based on position. Kinetic energy is based on motion. If a mass is in motion, it has kinetic energy. And we can actually quantify it pretty simply. The kinetic energy is equal to a half, oops, sorry, a half of the mass of the object that's moving times the speed squared. And I won't go through why it's one half times the mass times the speed squared, but let's just say that the more massive something is, if it's in motion, the more kinetic energy it has. And if it's moving faster, the more kinetic energy it has, okay? So let's write this as one half m and I'm gonna use a V. The reason I'm using a V is because I'm gonna use the term velocity instead of speed, okay? So um, I'm not gonna go into the details of speed and velocity, you learn that in physics, but essentially it's a measure of how fast something is moving. And what we find is that the kinetic energy depends more strongly on the speed, the velocity, it's velocity squared, whereas it's just mass to the first power. So doubling the mass will double the kinetic energy, but doubling the velocity will quadruple the amount of kinetic energy. So speed is very, very important. A bullet, for example, generally has very little mass. Like when you look at a bullet in a gun, in a rifle, for example, it might look like it's this big, but the actual projectile that comes out is very tiny. It's like, it's like that. And, but it moves very fast. So it doesn't have very much mass, but it has enormous speed, greater than the speed of sound. 
So if that's the case, it's going to have a lot of kinetic energy. So this little particle can make a big impact. Okay, so that's kinetic energy. Um, what we're going to say is that the total energy is merely the sum of the two. It's the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. If you add those two together, you've got the total energy, at least from a simplistic perspective. It gets more complicated when you look at more complex situations, but essentially that's the situation we're looking at, the sum of those two energies. Okay. So, uh, Professor, so the, the potential energy is uh, the potential for the bicycle to move down. And kinetic energy is actually the bicycle moving down. Exactly, exactly. So, so as it moves faster and faster, what you're seeing is a conversion from one to the other, which is interesting, right? So in nature, energy can be stored, which we call potential, stored energy. But as the position changes, it can be converted into kinetic energy. And so you, you see, even though the total is the same, one is being converted into another, exactly. Okay. Let's take a look at that Alex problem where they show you... Um, this little bicycle. It'd be kind of nice if they broadened it a little bit. The bicycle is the example they give. You could do a rocket and stuff like that too, perhaps, but whatever. Um, so anyways, so here you have this bicyclist. Uh, the bicycle, I think, is moving in this direction. And then you can see what's going to happen. It's going to go down these hill and then come back up here. And really what they're asking you to do is to kind of just qualitatively figure out what's going to happen with the kinetic and potential energy here. And they have one, two, three, four, five, six, A through F, six different kind of positions there. It looks like position A and E are at the same level. It looks like F is higher, so that's the highest position. D is sort of the minimum, we call it. We call this a global minimum. It's the lowest value for the whole thing. B is what's called a local minimum, right? It's a minimum, if you take a look at it, it goes down to a minimum and then comes back up. So that's called a local minimum. But D is called the global minimum because it's the lowest for the entire path, okay? So where would the bicyclist have the highest potential energy? So, so again, this is gravitational that we're looking at, right? The earth is pulling the bicycle and the bicyclist to the center. So the further away you are from the center of the earth, the more potential energy you have. So just like the building, the higher up you are in the building, the more potential. So F is the highest point, so that would have the most potential energy. The lowest potential energy would be the global minimum, right? So the global minimum is D, that's the lowest point here. So that would be the minimum, the lowest potential energy. Um, the third point is where's the highest kinetic? Now this is where you get the conversion. So the idea, we're ignoring friction, we're ignoring heat and all that kind of stuff. Those things do happen, they're real. And you know, when people design real machines, they have to take those into account. But we're looking at it from a pretty simplistic point of view, it's just kinetic and potential. So the idea is as you go downhill, you go faster, as you go uphill, you go slower. So wherever you are kind of at the minimum point, that's where you're gonna have the most kinetic energy, okay? So you'll accelerate down, then you'll slow down a little bit, and then you'll accelerate some more, and you should be moving the fastest at that global minimum. So the highest kinetic should be a D. The highest speed, remember the formula is kinetic energy equals one half mv squared. So where you have the highest kinetic energy, you'll also have the highest speed. So that would also be true for D. You should be moving the fastest where you have the highest kinetic energy. Um, would the kinetic energy be higher at A or B? Well, again, the idea is as you move down the hill, you go faster. So more kinetic energy at B than you would have at A. Um, potential energy, again, as you go down, your potential energy is decreasing as it's converted into kinetic, okay? 
So B would have the lower um, potential energy, but A would have the higher potential energy. So higher is the question. So that would be A. And then this is a good question. What about the total energy? Again, we're going to ignore friction and heating and all of that. Assume that we just have kinetic and just have potential. So the answer there is it's the same. The total energy we're assuming is the same throughout the whole process, right? In reality, that wouldn't be true, right? So what's going to happen is you're going to lose some energy in the form of heat as your, as your um, wheels are striking the surface and you got friction. You'll have what they call frictional heating. You're also pushing air molecules away. And so some of your energy is going to go into pushing those air molecules. So you're losing that energy. But from a simplistic perspective, the total energy should be the same wherever you are along this path. Well, why, why is that? Why is it that um, they should be the same throughout, um, just in terms of like simplistic reasons? So it's actually a very deep question. And it's something that was debated in the 20th century, even by astronomers. The question is like, what is energy? Well, we have this definition, we have a working definition that it's essentially the capacity to do work, right? All right. As far as we know, energy is constant in the entire universe. It's all the experimentation has shown that it's constant. And if it is constant, then, and you know, we believe that to be true, then it becomes what we call a law, a scientific law. So the scientific law is called the law of conservation of energy, which states that for processes like this, the energy should be the same no matter what happens. So we sort of take that now as a fact as opposed to trying to prove it, okay? Why it's the case is a good question. Um, you know, probably because you're not creating any new matter, right? So ultimately energy comes from space and matter. That's where energy comes from. If you have space, you have energy. Mm -hmm. If you have matter, you have energy. So we're not creating any space. We're not creating any matter. So if those two things are constant, then the energy, the energy should, should be constant, be constant too, right? But again, that's been, that was debated in the 20th century. There were astronomers, you know, prominent, a relatively prominent, astronomer who believed that if you studied space, you'd find that actually energy is being produced all the time. Um, but that was the minority opinion and it's still a pretty, it's a, that's pretty um, trace opinion now. I don't think anybody of any significance believes that anymore, but, but who knows, you know, I mean, you find kind of strange things, right? And, um, the idea that space has energy is a relatively new idea. It turns out space itself, even if there's nothing in it, actually has energy. So, um, but yeah, that would be my answer would be that if you're not creating space, you're not creating matter, you're not creating any energy. It should be the same. But again, we are making a simplification here that, that it's not being converted into other forms. And um, so we'll see in this chapter that when actual processes occur in nature, some energy is converted into what we call heat. And that would definitely happen here. Some of that energy would be converted into heat. Mm -hmm. um, suppose the bicyclist, this is a, the thing about Alex is when you get to these questions that are very, very long like that, I get a little bit nervous because then you really have to kind of read, read it very carefully. Suppose the bicyclist lets off the brakes and coasts down the valley without pedaling. Okay, so the brakes are off, so you're not slowing down due to braking, and you're not pedaling, so you're just going down. So you're just coasting down. Even if there's no friction or air resistance to slow her down, what is the farthest point the bicyclist could reach without pedaling. Okay, so how far can the bicyclist go without pedaling? And the idea would be that if you start here, you have a certain amount of potential energy. And that's the amount of energy you're starting off with. And we're assuming that you don't have any kinetic energy. So the maximum height you could go back up would be essentially where you started, 
right? So, so in other words, you can't start here, not put any energy in and then go higher than that. Because if you did that, you would have more potential energy at the end than you did when you started. So you would have created energy in that process. And there are, you know, there are people that try to sell us on that idea that you can, you know, the modern technique is to call something zero point energy and say that you have limitless zero point energy. It turns out that's not true. You can't get more energy out of something than what you start off with. So if you started A, the highest you could get would be up to E and you just wouldn't be able to get up to F without pedaling. Of course you could pedal, um, but if, if you don't pedal or you don't have someone pushing you or pulling you, I guess the wind could blow, right? The wind could blow you up a little bit, but other than that, in absence of all those, you know, excess energy things, um, the highest you could get up would be E. Okay. So that's, you know, um, just sort of an introduction into this idea of um, potential and kinetic energy. So let's do this. Oops. Let's stop that. Here we go. Okay, so now we're going to go um, straight into uh, a pretty deep problem here. And I want to go over this problem. I, it's, there's actually, what you'll find is that if you look at the videos from last semester that I posted on Blackboard, um, the links are on Blackboard and then they're all on YouTube, is that I actually did this problem a couple times. I did some additional works on this one because it's a pretty complicated problem. And it really hits at a lot of the issues that we're going to cover in this chapter. So I'm going to take a few minutes here to go over this particular problem. This is the idea of heat and work. Those are the two forms of energy that we're going to deal with. Okay. So let me um, talk about this. This is called a gas cylinder. And, you know, in a sense, the whole thing is actually called a, um, a calorimeter. So let me make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay, so understanding the definitions of heat and work. So let me first show you the picture here. Imagine this out here, this gray region out here. That is essentially a thermos. So, you know, they make these amazing thermoses you can buy on Amazon now for 20 bucks or 15 even maybe that will really keep things warm or think, keep things cold for a long, long time. They're just impressive. They have reflective material on the insides here so that heat is reflected back in. Um, so it can't get in or out of the, of the thermos. Um, they use like a vacuum so that you don't have air to conduct heat out. And um, they're just really impressive things. So the idea here is you have a good thermos on the outside um, inside is water. And the reason that water is in there is because water is very good for measuring temperature. It's a liquid. It conducts heat relatively well. So if you put a thermometer in it, you can measure the temperature of water, right? So that's what this is right here. It's an old school thermometer. We wouldn't use this kind of thermometer for most cases now. We would use something more sophisticated, but this is a alcohol filled thermometer with little lines and numbers written on it that you can measure. Okay, so the idea is that thermometer is gonna measure the temperature of that water. And inside this cylinder, now it's kind of boxy, so a cylinder is round, but this is a two-dimensional depiction of a cylinder. There are gases, and those gases, we're not gonna talk about what they are right now. We'll look at that later in the chapter. They are essentially reactants that will combine to form products and release energy or absorb energy in the process. So the reactants get converted to products and either energy is either released from that reaction or absorbed by the reaction. So if it's absorbed, the energy has to come from the water. The water is really the only substance around it that has enough mass to provide energy. So if energy is pulled from the water into the gases, the water will get colder. 
right? That's what we call thermochemistry. The chemical reaction occurs, the temperature changes. So the thermometer is what tells us that's happening. On the other hand, if the gases react and they produce energy, that energy will go out into the water and the water will get hotter. We call that heat. Heat is the transfer of energy from something that is hot to something that is colder. Generally speaking, heat will move from the hotter region to the colder region and not the other way. So for example, if you take, if you take a, a hot cup of coffee and you put an ice cube in it, the coffee will not cool down the ice cube. The ice cube will not heat up the coffee. Now, people debated why that's the case. Like, why couldn't it go both ways? And it turns out it's statistics. And we cover that in the next course, Chemistry 1200, why it is that something that's hot transfers this heat to something that's cold and not the other way around. But um, that's essentially what happens. So heat is the transfer of energy from the hotter to the colder. And wait, wait, Professor, I'm sorry. Why, why is that? Why is it that that happens? I understand we, we do it in the next course, but like, I'm, not, I, you know, I'm just actually interested. Why yeah, really, it's a very simple answer. It's the same reason that if I take a deck of cards and flip them up in the air, they don't land in a deck. Mm -hmm. right? Take a deck of cards and you flip them up in the air, they, they go all over the place, right? For statistics, now we don't think about it this way. We, that's just, we're just used to that happening. That's just how nature works, right? But it's a statistical phenomenon, really. The reason that cards do that is because the probability statistically of them oh. landing on top of each other in order is zero, essentially. It's one times 10 to the minus 23rd. So if you did it once every second for 13 billion years, it still wouldn't happen. Now, if you did it for, you know, 10 to the 20 years, which is, you know, much longer than the life of the universe, then you might eventually get it to happen once, <laughs> but it just doesn't happen, right? So the same is true. If heat were to flow from colder to hotter, statistically, that's only going to happen once out of 10 to the 23rd times so that you'll have to wait, you know longer than the age of the universe. the universe will be gone actually according to the physicists the universe will be long gone before that would actually happen so that's in oh, okay. and that's the reason why it's just statistic. Right. Yeah. And this, uh, yeah my next question was going to be uh is there because uh, you said generally speaking right uh so i was wondering have we ever reported so there's a trick there's a trick we can do and it's called an air conditioner so an air conditioner oh. does the opposite a refrigerator does the opposite they actually take uh hot air and move it away from the cold right so how does that work the answer is if you provide energy you can do it you can make things that will not occur statistically happen if you use energy to do it so you can use energy to move energy essentially got it and so you know unplug the refrigerator it won't happen anymore unplug the air conditioner it won't happen anymore or if con ed decides to turn down the voltage it won't happen as much right so that's that's the way okay well what about um, what about it in terms of like um without human intervention does it happen like in space or anything like is there uh an instance of something like that happening well all kinds of weird things can happen in nature right so like i was just reading that um these steady scientists that are trying to find signs that there's intelligent life in the universe. One of the things that's limited them is that they've been looking for radio waves. And so they're only able to use these telescopes that can look at a very small, like a millionth of the, all the angles that are possible, right? Mm -hmm. So what they decided to do very cheaply, actually, this year is use lasers. So look for laser beams. So they have these detectors that can be built pretty cheaply for $1,000 and look for laser light. Why? Because lasers are not something that occur in nature very often. Right? Lasers essentially have to be produced um, by intelligence. However, it turns out there are these weird phenomena that occur on an occasion in nature where like for 
a few seconds, something will act like a laser. It will actually produce a beam, a narrow beam at the same wavelength, you know, like the, the atmosphere of Mars does it once a year or something. So it's like, it does happen, right? So like, you have to be careful. Like if you're looking at a small region, something unusual might happen there. But the question is, is it common or is it typical? Mm -hmm. so the answer is it, is is it just Mars reflecting off again? <laughs> Yeah, just, you know, if the light is right and it's hitting the molecules just right, it might do something, right? So, like, there's all kinds of things, interesting things that happen, right? So, um, you know, this, the, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, you know, is, is an interesting project because people are doing it in different ways. Like, so one way would be that if you have a star and, you know, you find that some of its light is getting dimmed that means something's going in front of it and so you sort of look at the pattern and that's actually one of the ways that you can tell whether there's a planet is the planet will kind of deflect some of the light block it so if you had a really intelligent species they might build a lot of satellites to gather up energy from the sun and use it and so what would happen is from us looking at it from a distance, it would look like the star is like dimming in light a little bit. So, you know, recently people saw that and they proposed that maybe um, it was due to some intelligence that was producing these huge satellites, swarms of them. Um, but then you find out later on that it turns out it's just a natural phenomenon of that star. It dims in some weird way that they've never seen before, right? So. Yeah, so all kinds of things are possible. It's exciting times for stuff like that. Um, so you got the water, you got the reactions occurring here. Chemo so, you know, when you think of a chemical reaction, think of like burning a match, right? So imagine I was burning a match in here. The match produces heat. The heat would go into the water and the water would get hotter. So what we do is we essentially say the following. If the water gets hotter, that means heat went into it, which means that the reaction released heat. When a reaction releases heat, we call that exothermic, all right? Exo meaning outside, so the heat is going outside, right? That's called exothermic. On the other hand, if the water gets colder, that means the heat's going from the water into the gases. That means that the reaction is absorbing heat, so that's called endothermic, into, E-N-D-O. And you can think of it in terms of a biology, there are animals that what we have called endoskeletons. Your like we, we have endoskeletons. We have our bones on in the middle, you know, inside the flesh. But then there are things like insects or lobsters that have exoskeletons. They're skeletons on the outside, right? So the idea is if heat goes in, that's endothermic. If heat goes out, that's exothermic. Okay. So that's one way that energy can go in or out of this reaction is through endo exo. Another way, the second way is what we call work. We talked a little bit about work before, but this is a specific type of work that we use in chemistry. It's called expansion work, expansion. So the idea here, this is called a piston and this whole thing here in the middle is called a cylinder. This piston is essentially like a plug that fits over the cylinder but it can move up or down. So it's like, imagine you have like a little rubber O-ring on the outside here that allows it to slide up and down. This is essentially how a internal combustion automobile works. You have what they call a gas cylinder with a piston and the piston can go up or down. The terminology we usually use is in or out, not up or down. So if the cylinder goes down, I'm sorry, if the piston goes down, that's in, and if the piston goes up, we're gonna call that out. So the terminology here is gonna be in or out. So down or up, right? So essentially the, the convention is if the piston goes down or in, it's doing work on the gases. The terminology is does work on, meaning gives energy to. So the second way that you can give energy to the gases is through work. So if, Imagine you pushed it down, that energy you're putting in to push it is gonna go into the gases. So if the piston does work on the gases, the gases now have more energy. On the other hand, if the gases push the piston out, then the gases lose that energy and we say that they do work 
on the piston. So it's usually piston does work on gases or reaction. Gases do work on piston or reaction does work on the piston. So that leaves us with two ways that energy can go in or out. It can go in through the form of heat and it can go in through the form of work, okay? So now there's some quantification in here, but it's mainly just sort of uh, qualitative information here. The last question here is, is quantitative, but it's a pretty simple calculation. So a mixture of gaseous reactants is put into a cylinder where a chemical reaction turns them into gaseous products. The cylinder has a piston that moves in or out as necessary to keep constant pressure of the mixture of one ATM. The cylinder is also submerged in a large insulated water bath. See the sketch it right. Okay, so that's just sort of the description of what's happening. The temperature of the water is monitored and it is determined from this data that 279 kilojoules of heat flows into the system during the reaction. The position of the piston is also monitored and it is determined from this data that the system does 250 kilojoules of work on the piston um, during this reaction. And then they ask you these questions, okay? So let me go through them one by one. Is the reaction exothermic or endothermic? So it's one or the other. So for that question, look at the, question, the, the, the issue of heat, okay? So it says here, 279 kilojoules of heat. The heat is what will tell you endo or exo, okay? Into the system. So again, we use different words. So I said gases, I said reactants, I said reaction. The system is these gases, okay? So if heat flows into it, that's endothermic, okay? So it's an endothermic reaction. The second question is, does the temperature of the water bath go up or down? And that's a good question. So if the heat is going into the gases, it's coming from the water, right? So if it's coming from the water, that means the water is losing the energy. The water is typically called the surroundings. So that, water, if it loses energy, it's going to get colder. And so the temperature of getting colder is going down. Okay. So if it's exothermic, the opposite, heat would go out and, and, and the temperature of the water would get higher. Right. So imagine a match would make the water get hotter, but we don't have a lot of examples. The one that I can think of is you can buy these little packets for injuries, these cold packs, and you bend it at the metal. It's usually in a little plastic package. You bend a little piece of metal in it, and then it turns to a crystal and it gets cold. That's an endothermic process. There aren't a lot. Most reactions are exothermic, but there are some that are endothermic. Okay, So temperature is going to go down because the heat is going away from the water and into the gases. Now, the issue of the piston, the piston is the work. So think of work in terms of the piston. So what does it say? It says the system, meaning the gases, do 250 kilojoules of work on the piston, okay? So that means the energy is going from the gases into the piston. So in order for the gases to do work on the piston, they have to push the piston away. Okay, so pushing away is out. Okay, so the terminology is work on the piston. That means the piston's going out. If it had said the piston did work on the system or the piston did work on the gases, then that would mean that the piston is coming down or is going in. Okay, so work is the in or out, and that's how you determine that. Now, does it absorb or release energy? That's that I have to kind of go through the calculation. These last two parts here, okay? These last two, those are really asking you the same question. It's just one is asking you for the qualitative. The second one is asking you to come up with a number, quantitative, right? So here's how we solve that problem.
up or down, or actually I think they use increase or decrease. And then they want you to quantify it how much. Turns out it's actually mathematically very simple. When they say it's increasing or decreasing, what they're talking about is change. Okay, so think about it. Like, for example, I like to use money as an example because it's something we work with, right? If your bank account increases, that's a change. If your bank account decreases, that's a change, right? We use the symbol delta as change. Okay, so this is the uppercase delta. So delta means change. So the question is, does the energy change delta? So we're going to call change in energy delta E. Very simple, delta E. So delta E could be increasing, it'd be positive. Delta E could be decreasing, it would be negative, right? So increase is positive, decrease is negative. And how do you calculate it? It's very simple. There's only two ways that energy can go in or out. Q is heat and W is work. Okay, those are the two ways. So energy can go in and out as heat or it can go in and out as work. The piston is the work, the endothermic, exothermic is the heat. So here's our convention. If the heat is, if it's exothermic, Q is negative. Okay, I'll put a little circle around it, negative. If it's endothermic, Q is positive. Okay. And this is in relation, uh, this is talking about the gases, right, area? The yeah, system. Yeah, exactly. Talking about the gases, exactly, from the perspective of the gases. And is then, it always from the perspective of the gases? Sorry. No, that's a very good question. That's a good question. It turns out engineers do it the opposite way. They don't care about the gases. That They leave that to the chemists. They're interested in the piston. Hmm because they want mechanical work. So, so it's actually, they use a different convention for that. Uh, let's see. But in chemistry- so Would they use would they use the same, sorry, would they use the same um, kind of just like uh, approach, just they would put it onto from the perspective of the piston rather than the, okay, got it. Yeah, that's right. What they do is they actually, they do it from the perspective of, of the work essentially. So. So they, they, they modify the equation a little bit. Instead of Q plus W, they do Q minus W, the difference. Oh, oh okay, okay. Um, but yeah, so, so when you go on to engineering courses, you'll see they use a different convention, but it'll be easy for you. Okay. And then the term for work, what we're going to do, this is really where it's really different with the engineers, is that for work, if the work is work done on the piston, then it's going to be negative. And if the work is done on the system, which is the gases, then it's positive. And that's that's really the main difference for, for the for the engineers is they do it the opposite way because work is good to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so in any case, that's our convention. So the numbers that we were given, so what they did was they gave us a couple numbers. They said 279 kilojoules of heat flows into the system. And we said that that was endothermic. Okay, because the system is the gases, that's endothermic. If it's endothermic, then Q is positive. So what I'm gonna do from that piece of information is I'm gonna say that Q is plus 279. These are just the units. These are called kilojoules. These are common units of energy in chemistry, okay? The second piece of, of information was that 
250 kilojoules of work was done on the piston by the gases, by the system, right? So our convention there is if it's done on the piston, then work is negative. Okay, so W would be negative 250 kilojoules. So be careful when you do this problem. I'm gonna circle the, or put boxes around these. They're gonna give you the two numbers, which is fine, but what you need to do is to figure out what their signs are. Are they positive or negative? And you're doing that from the language they're using. So I would recommend that you have a card or a piece of paper where you write the convention down. You know, if work is done, you know, on the piston, work is negative. If work is done on the gases, then work is positive. If heat is flowing out of the gases, that's exothermic and that's negative for Q. If heat is flowing into the gases, that's endothermic and Q is positive. And then if you get the signs right, look how simple the arithmetic is, right? You're just adding two numbers together and then you'll be fine. So now it looks like our delta E, which is Q plus W, would be 279. And then you're going to add a negative number. Okay. Now, if you add a negative number, that's like subtracting a positive number. So you get 29 kilojoules. So it looks like it's still positive. I'm going to put a positive sign there. But there's our delta E, positive. So the answer is, does it absorb or release energy? If it's positive, it's going to absorb energy. If it's negative, it's going to release energy. Okay, and that's that's the convention we're using. Absorbing is positive, releasing is negative. But now it's the total energy, right? We call this the total energy. It's really the total energy change. So basically, uh, for it to release energy, it needs to do more work onto the piston. So the number has to be greater, right? Yes, exactly. exactly. And uh, how, how can, um, how does that happen? Has it happened because of the uh, different gases or do you have to put in more energy? Like, because now, okay. So basically what I'm thinking is that if I increase the energy, right? If I increase the, the, um, the heat, right? Uh, from the water into the gases. What I'm just thinking is that wouldn't it always just be lagging behind? Doesn't that mean that the it wouldn't be giving? How can I basically increase? How can I start making it release energy rather than absorb energy? Is right. is it really what's in the system that matters? It matters for sure. So if you look at the example, this example. Um, it's an endothermic reaction. So it actually absorbs energy from the water, right? right? Now that's perfectly fine, but it wouldn't be a good way to make a machine. If you wanna make a better machine, you essentially want a reaction that releases energy so that you can do work on the piston, right? In the end, the idea of these gas cylinders is to do mechanical work to push that piston, because if you push the piston, that piston is an object that's moving. That motion can be used to turn a wheel, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we really wanna do is we wanna have a reaction that releases enough energy that it pushes the piston up and you can get mechanical work out that out of that and, and turn something some rotational motion, right? There's devices. Oh, oh okay, I, I was thinking about it all wrong. I. I got it. Okay. The whole really, thing if you want, if, if your goal is to do mechanical work, you really want an exothermic reaction. Okay. So this example was an endothermic reaction because we should be able to do both. 
but the more practical design would use an exothermic. Is an exothermic reaction. And yeah. in the exothermic reaction, some of that energy is gonna come out as heat as well. So if you think about an internal combustion automobile, it produces a lot of heat, right? It gets hot, right? Mm -hmm. It gets hot because these reactions are exothermic. So if you take right. gasoline, vapor, vaporized gasoline and combine it with oxygen in the air, you get a combustion reaction, which is exothermic. We'll look at that later in the chapter. The exothermic reaction, some of it is heat, which has some benefits, particularly on a cold morning, it keeps everything working. Um, but really we're trying to do mechanical work. That's the main goal of a car is to move, not to heat the environment, but we can't get away from it. Some of it is going to be lost as heat, that's waste heat. And so we have to have a radiator built into the automobile to, to, to get rid of that heat as much as it can. Pull it down, right, yeah. Pull it down and that sort of thing, right? But and that the, the radiator would be an endothermic reaction, right? Radi, I mean not radiator, right? The whatever cools down the car is what I'm saying. Is it? So I'm I'm thinking about you said the air conditioning, right? That's a that's an endothermic reaction, like your fridge and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so the term thermic refers to heat, right? Right. So endothermic, exothermic, a an air conditioner or a refrigerator um, are what we would call um, endergonic. We actually use- Endergonic? Yeah. Um, so like it, endergonic is like the total amount of energy. So not just the heat, but all of the energy because it's got electrical energy you're using as well, right? So it's, it's absorbing the energy from the electric. Oh, I might have mistaken it with the ice pack example where you told us when were you just told were you were you told about how when you crack an ice pack, right? Like all of the uh water like freezes. That's an endothermic reaction, right? That's an you, endothermic God. reaction. That's okay. I, I I mistook uh the ice pack with the air conditioning thing. Yeah. The air right. conditioning was talking about so, yeah, no, that's good because you know, because so yeah, that's a so an air con that's a good point. So an in, uh, an air conditioner or a, a refrigerator, that is a device that does a cooling cycle, right? Mm -hmm. So it has a, what they call a cycle. Here we're talking about something simpler. We're just talking about some chemical reaction that's occurring and releasing or absorbing heat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand now. I remember now you brought up the air conditioning and the refrigerator as an example to talk about how uh, when I asked why is it that um, energy goes from uh, hot to cold, right? And then you said, yeah, does it always happen, right? Does it right? Always and then and then I asked, um, yep, I remember now. Got it. Absolutely. Um, Good. All right. So that's the one that I wanted to go through in particular, because it's kind of, you know, there's a lot in that, right? It's a lot of language. It's uh, several ideas there. We haven't talked about the units, kilojoules much, but we'll get to that in the next lecture and the next, meet, next meeting. But that's a good problem, you know, that people can get stuck on because there's five parts to that question. And so I wanted to definitely go over that so that people can see that. Let me just bring it up again, just so that it's here. There we go. So there's that problem. Okay. So what I'm going to do in the next meeting is, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I'm going to look at the next section, which is called enthalpy. And in enthalpy, we're going to talk a little bit more about this idea of the cylinder and the um, the work that's done on the piston or by the piston. And then we're going to look at a definition of enthalpy. And we'll mainly just spend our time talking about enthalpy because that's a, an important topic. It's related to this idea of heat. And um, chemists use enthalpy all the time. Okay. okay. And it, it will all be happening from the uh, perspective of the system, right? Yes, that's how Not, we'll look at it from the perspective of the gases, the reaction, the system. We can use all three of those words. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much.
Very good. Have a great night. Take you care. You too. Have a great night. Bye-bye.